Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're very pleased to welcome you to a two-part series of our program. We welcome uh, a longtime friend, uh, Gregory C. Carr. He is the co uh, founder of Boston Technology Incorporated in 1986 and served as CEO until 1992. He was chairman of the board from April 1992 until Boston Technology developed uh, a voicemail merged with Converse Technology in January of 1998. From 1996 to 1998, Mr. Carr was chairman of Prodigy Incorporated, a global internet service provider. He served on the board of Physicians for Human Rights and continues to do so and is on the witness board of advocates and is the advisory board chair for the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. Our guest is a native of Idaho. He was born in Idaho Falls and is the youngest of seven children. He graduated from Skyline High School in Idaho Falls in 1977. Uh, he received his baccalaureate degree in history from Utah State University in 1982 and he holds a master's degree in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, which was received in 1986. Our guest has recently um, signed a contract with the government of Mozambique, and he is helping uh, that country in its redevelopment through his efforts and the Carr Foundation. They hope to um, alleviate poverty in that uh, very wonderful country, and in particular, his foundation will be building health care and industry uh, in that country, uh, and particularly education facilities. Our guest has been so generous to human rights in his work, both in our state and across this nation and now internationally. We particularly want to address some of these issues, such as the challenge of AIDS in Africa, and uh, economic development, and the environment, and uh, numerous other issues. Uh, Greg Carr, it's such a pleasure having you here. Uh, we've had you here before. and. Thank you for all you do for humanity. We are grateful that you've taken these resources that you've been blessed with to serve humanity. Well, thanks for having me back, Tony. I think my third time here. Yes, we're just so delighted to have you here. And so always, we're very pleased to have our regular panelists, uh, Janelle Burke and Erna Reinhardt. And we'll start the questioning with Janelle Burke. Welcome to the program again, Greg. It's a pleasure to have you here. Before our viewers can understand what's happening in Mozambique today, it's necessary to know what happened yesterday. So can you give us a brief history of Mozambique? Certainly. Uh, Mozambique uh, is in southern Africa, and it was a Portuguese colony for about five centuries. In fact, it was a Portuguese colony up until 1975. And the Mozambicans spent, from 1962 to 1975, in a war for their independence with the Portuguese. And they finally gained their independence in 1975, but then had their own civil war to then decide who would run the country. So there was another decade of war. And they actually had 30 years of war altogether, from 62 to 92, after five centuries of colonialism. So they really started in 1992 as one of the poorest countries on earth. But they've been working hard in the past 12 years, and they're making progress, and they're they're trying to build their economy. Can you show us on the map where Mozambique is? This is one of those things that people don't always, they, they know Mozambique, but they don't know necessarily right where it is in Africa. So can you begin to show us where that might be? Mozambique is down uh, in southern Africa, and it's on the Indian Ocean. It's a beautiful country. It has about 1,500 miles of Indian Ocean coastline with coral reefs and it borders uh, South Africa uh, on the south and Tanzania on the north. And is the weather there very balmy, I would take it, probably? Uh, they're pretty close to the equator and, and uh, they do have a tropical climate uh, and they have uh, uh, some rainforest and, and uh, uh, a variety of other kinds of forests and um, it, they, they never have a frost in Mozambique. It's, it's warm. To put it into perspective about how big is it in size compared with uh, some Mozambique that we know. is about four times the size of Idaho, okay. to put it in our terms. Arnold Reinhardt. Greg, welcome to the show. 
There are so many humanitarian needs all around the world. Tell our viewers um, how you became interested in Mozambique. Uh, it started about um, three or four years ago. I met some members of the Mozambican government uh, and they invited me there to, to work with them. The, the, the Mozambican government would like to build their economy, they would like to create a health care system and an education system, and they're starting with almost nothing, and they need help, and they need help of, of uh, other governments, but they all also need help of private individuals. And uh, so I was invited uh, to work uh, with the Ministry of Tourism, actually, to, to build a tourism industry with them and to try to create some jobs uh, and to alleviate poverty. You have a, a specific project that you're working on in that country. Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that. Well, Mozambique, uh, in, in the center of Mozambique, they had uh, at one time one of the most beautiful national parks in all of Africa. So when you think of being in a, a, on a gorgeous safari with elephants and lions and all of that, they had that in a place called Gorongosa National Park in the center of the country. But during the 30 years of war, uh, a lot of the war happened right there, and the infrastructure of the park was destroyed, and the animals were, 95% of the animals were poached. So right now, as it stands, a tourist isn't going to want to go there because you aren't going to see very much, and there's nowhere to stay. So uh, we're working with the government to rebuild Gorongosa National Park, uh, to stop the poaching with, by training anti-poaching game scouts, and to create some tourist facilities and, and to, to bring people back and to create some jobs. Greg, I don't know how many of our viewers know a, a lot about your work. I, I just want to point out, I didn't do it in the introduction uh, in depth, but the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy in Cambridge, and you work at Harvard with your center, you have a wonderful staff, you have a new building, and that is your operations center for helping humanity. And, You've given millions of dollars in Idaho to Idaho Falls uh, community and the boys of community in here, dealing with all kinds of human rights issues and preserving mm -hmm. history. Um, you do a lot of work on the East and, and dealing with the, the arts and humanities as it relates to human rights. And now here you are working internationally, which we really commend you for doing. You're just really serving in so many ways that's so needed. But one of the reasons why I was so attracted to your work in um, Africa is that uh, one of the challenges, and, and one of your positive points is that you do identify challenges, but you also have hope in how you deal with it. And one of the things we hear so much about is AIDS in Africa and the, mm -hmm. the incredible uh, tragedy that is. Would you tell us how that particular problem that's across Africa is in Mozambique, and in particular in the central part where you're working, and yeah. you may want to use the map to show us why that that has been the most difficult. Mm. Uh, place within that country to uh, uh, try to combat the, the problem mm -hmm. of AIDS? Well, Southern Africa right now has an enormous health care crisis and over the next 10 years as many as 10 million people will die of AIDS in Southern Africa and that will create as many as 30 million orphans. So just when Mozambique for instance, one of the Southern African countries, was starting to make progress and starting to build their economy AIDS is sweeping through there and will destroy their economy because we're losing all of the productive members of society. We're so losing... You have the young left and the elderly, but the middle parts... We're losing there. the teachers and the, and the people who, who know how to create uh, jobs and so forth. And in particular, in central Mozambique is one of the worst areas uh, for this health care crisis. Uh, I'm pointing to a, a, a road that, that goes from the center of Africa to the ocean. It's a trucking mm -hmm. route. And whenever you have a lot of uh, people moving along a road, you're going to have the spread of the HIV virus. And also, the war took place in the center of the country. And again, when you have a lot of soldiers and you have a lot of war, you're also going to have the spread of the HIV virus. But it's not, it's not just uh, AIDS. It's tuberculosis, it's malaria, it's cholera. I mean, it's a general health care crisis. And we want to work with the Mozambican government, it's a good government, it's an honest government, and, we, and, and we're working with them to create some health care institutions uh, in the center of the country. Uh, but health care means a lot more than just having medicine or just having a health care clinic to attend. It, it means a complete healthy lifestyle. I mean, mm -hmm. malnutrition is a problem, mm -hmm. so you need to have a job. 
You need to have food. You need to have uh, hope for the future for a reason to care about your health. So there are many components for this to work. You, you can't just work on one thing like the health issue. You have to work on jobs. You have to work on having professionals to do all these things. So there's, um, there's many fronts to work on at once. Well, that's right. Um, in, in central Mozambique, uh, your typical person has probably never been to a healthcare clinic in their life, may have never set, school, uh, set foot in a school in their life. And so you build a healthcare clinic, you build a school, but when they graduate from school, they need to have a job, so you need to build an economy. So you really need to do a little bit of mm -hmm. everything at once. And that's why we selected uh, this national park, where if we can create a first-class destination for tourists, we can create jobs, and we can give our health care uh, healthcare to our employees and, uh, and, and build some schools in the area. So it's, it's a comprehensive, multidisciplinary project. Thank you. Janelle Burke. I want to follow up with my last question and ask some questions about the kind of government that there is in Mozambique. What kind of government agencies are there there? Uh, they, they do have a good government. It's a democratic government. In fact, they're having an election next week, and uh, they have a two-party system. Uh, I've met with a lot of different ministries, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, I like the people I've met with. Their challenge is that they don't have enough uh, people in their country to draw upon for all of the skills that they need. There just aren't enough people who have been to college yet or have advanced degrees. And so a big goal for a group like us is to work with them to build their capacity. And how many people altogether live in, in Mozambique? Uh, there's 18 million people. 18 million people. And out of that number, um, what kind of percentage would you say do, have had some kind of education? Do most of the students have some kind of education so they can read and write, but mm. rather elementary? About half of the children in Mozambique are not in school at all. And the schools that do exist, many of them uh, are, are not adequate in that they don't have uh, good teachers, they don't have good books, and uh, uh, it's an enormous challenge. I respect the Ministry of Education there, and they're doing a good job, but it's just an enormous challenge to build all the schools and to find the teachers for those schools. Arnold Reinhardt. Greg, based on the history of the country and where they are now, um, my understanding is, a, is that there's a lot of international organizations in Mozambique trying to all do uh, good things for the people there. But how do you, as an outsider coming into that country, how do you gain that, those people's trust yeah. and that government's trust? Because that's got to be yeah. a foundation that, that permeates through everything that you do. It's a really important question, and, and I am an outsider when I go to Mozambique, and I always need to remember that. Uh, I'm there and my team is there because we were invited by the government to help, but every step of the way we have to remember that that's our goal, is to help their government to achieve their goals. And uh, uh, they, they do have a good vision for their country, and they're trying to do the right thing. Um, there's a lot of Europeans there that are helping. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development is there helping. It's, it's not a matter of there not being good people. It's, it's a matter of the scale of the issues, the scale of the problems that we're dealing with, that um, as much is happening, we, we just need more help. You probably have developed uh, relationships with different people there, and I would like for you to just take a minute to maybe share with us um, someone mm. there that is special to you that has maybe touched your life mm. that has that you have a great memory of. Well, that's uh, that's easy. There's a woman, and her name is Teresina de Silva, and uh, she's about uh, 60 years old, and she's a human rights worker in the capital city of Mozambique, which is Maputo. And uh, I met her about four years ago because she came to Harvard for a year and was at our Human Rights Center um, and was outstanding. And then she went back to her country and has been a leader for uh, human rights in Mozambique. She organized uh, women uh, in various human rights organizations focusing on girl education. A lot of families don't want to send their girls to school, for instance. So she's just been a real fighter and a smart, uh, courageous person. On that note, 
<coughs> Greg, we'd like to show some visuals because our viewers will feel like they've been to Mozambique with you, and they're going to put the slides up now. We have about uh, 10 or so slides. So here's the first one, if you'll take us through these. We are in central Mozambique, and this is actually the headquarters of Gorongosa National Park. And when we go to the next slide, you'll see a little closer up what happened during the war. Uh, it's typical of a lot of infrastructure in Mozambique that was destroyed during the war. This park used to have a lot of tourists, and if we can bring tourists back, we can create employment. And the next slide is an example of uh, one of our anti-poaching game scouts. And uh, if we can uh, uh, create a tourist economy in central Mozambique, then uh, a lot of people like this will get jobs. Mm -hmm. Most people right now exist on subsistence level agriculture. Which is the next slide. Uh, and uh, they barely get by. And you can see that children are working in the field uh, instead of being in school. And uh, that women uh, who have small babies are, are working in the field. Uh, and children are gathering firewood, which is the only energy source uh, that they have. No electricity. Uh, no electricity. Um, and this is an example of the houses that they build for themselves and they live in. Um, and the next slide is a school. And there aren't many schools uh, That's just amazing. in central Mozambique. And, uh, but, but we're building schools, and, uh, and when the children get a chance to go to school, uh, they, uh, they absolutely love it. And uh, uh, so I love the people, and, um, and, uh, and we can make progress. They're just wonderful faces, and they, they seem so much with hope. Also, on my round here, we... Uh, your staff sent us lots of things, which is so helpful to our viewers. We're going to have about two minutes of video, and if you will take us through this video, because it gives a, another picture of, of where you've been and, and the work you're doing there. Okay. Well, imagine you're on a safari in Africa with us, and you're out in what's called the savanna, and uh, you can see some of our anti-poaching scouts. Uh, if, if we're going to rebuild, 95% of the, of the large mammals in this park were poached during the war. They will make a comeback if we can just uh, uh, stop the poaching and, and we're bringing biologists in to help manage and preserve the ecosystem, which has never really been studied. It's a beautiful area. It? It's a beautiful area, and this is where you might see a, a lions or leopards, uh, lots of antelope, uh, uh, sable. And uh, you can just imagine that tourists would love to come to a place like this mm -hmm. if there were some facilities and a nice place to stay and you felt safe. Um, where they're walking right now are these limestone gorges, and I don't think that anyone has walked there in over 40 years. So I think there'd be a lot of adventurous tourists that like to come here. Here's a lion. We have several prides of lion in the park now. They're making a comeback. That's part of the critical... Uh, establishment for tourists in the future. It's really important. A tourist wants to see, uh, wants to see a lion. And uh, um, some of these animals were completely poached from the park and they have found their way back. So that's mm -hmm. exciting. And if we just help them out a little bit, uh, they'll have another chance. There's five different primates that live in the park. You're seeing some antelope off there. Uh, this is one of our leaders. And uh, we, uh, we will need to build some more roads. There's a, a beautiful Gorongosa Mountain that collects rainfall uh, for the park. And, uh, and these are limestone gorges. And we're now heading up uh, what's called Gorongosa Mountain, where we'll have a view uh, of the area. And uh, some people may be s familiar with safaris in Kenya or Tanzania. And very few people think of Mozambique for their safaris, so I hope we can change that. You, when you go through there, it just must be a, such a thrilling uh, experience to know that that all these potential things are there to not only enjoy that beauty, but also to, it's it's one of the the gates to prosperity for the people of the area. Well, they have a beautiful country, and in the center of Mozambique is one of the poorest places in the world. It's also one of the most beautiful places in the world. So if we can turn that beauty into tourism dollars and at the same time preserve that ecosystem, then we can, we can bring everything together. Thank you, Janelle Burke.
the animals were awesome, and, and that lion, he was just terrific. Um, but I want to turn to another subject, and that is the subject of AIDS and children. How many children are, you mentioned that many of them will be perhaps orphaned because of AIDS, right. but, but how many of them are infected themselves? Yes, it's, it's one of the great tragedies of AIDS is that, of course, you can uh, get AIDS from, you can get the HIV virus from your mother. And uh, there, there are non-governmental organizations working in the area. I, I met with a very inspiring uh, American couple uh, who were there uh, just living on a little bit of money. Uh, but they were trying to uh, place AIDS orphans into foster homes, and they were working through those issues. Um, it's, it's that we just don't have enough people who are willing to go and live there and do this hard work. Uh, these are solvable problems. They're enormous problems, uh, but they're solvable. And, and, and we now have medicine that will prevent the transmission uh, of the HIV virus from a pregnant woman to her child. Uh, we, meaning the rest of the world, just need to care enough to get that medicine and, and to get the healthcare professionals there to do the job. How many women know they're infected? Do they know they're passing mm -hmm. it on to their, to their babies? That's one of the big challenges um, is, is education. And, and uh, uh, there's also language barriers. And, and, and so, um, and, and one of the problems is that you can't get enough trained nurses to be in these very difficult areas to do the work. And a lot of times when a country like Mozambique gets some trained nurses, they actually get stolen away by wealthier countries that don't have enough nurses. Mm -hmm. And so it's just one challenge after another. All right, all right. Let's talk a little bit, Greg, about the infrastructure of the country, because I know that that's got to be a huge challenge in itself. Mm. Share with our viewers um, a little bit about just what we would consider very basic, yeah. water and electricity, and, mm -hmm. and what parts of the country, are there parts of the country that do mm. have that, and, mm. and where you are at, is there anything there? In the large cities, like the capital city of Mozambique, Maputo, um, it's a beautiful city, and you would find a lot of what you expect to find uh, in a large city in America, uh, with clean water and good electricity and nice houses. Uh, but about two-thirds of the population in Mozambique are rural. And when you get very far uh, from town, you probably end up in a situation where there is no electricity. And worse than no electricity is no clean water. And one of the first things you do when you go to a small village is you need to you need to dig a well so that there's clean water, so that children don't get cholera and so forth. Um, because even if you build a school, no children are going to show up if they're sick, or if they have to walk uh, five miles each day back and forth to the river to get water and so on. So even just building a school, you need to actually take the entire village in your arms and 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 uh, build a health care clinic and do a lot of things if you're actually going to have people successfully. Uh, in school learning. And are those two things, water and electricity, where are they on the radar in terms of priority by the government? Uh, the government, to give you an idea of, of the government's challenges, um, their health care budget is seven dollars per capita. So it's hard to do a lot of health care with that. So if, if you were the, the president of Mozambique, you'd be making choices between clean water, electricity, health care, education, and you just don't have enough budget to go around. So that's where the international community needs to care enough to go and, and respond to their request and to work with them. Um, because it, it's, it, the problem is you need to do everything at once to make any progress. Uh, the good news and the heartening news is there's a lot of countries there that are helping. Uh, there's inspiring and courageous people. It's just that we need more. I want to ask a question about nonprofits, but as I do, I want them to put up on the screen. This is my idea. Let's <clears throat> put on the screen your website because your center in, in Cambridge is just a, a real wealth of information that. I just want people to be able to go beyond this program to find out more about you, and it's gone up there. And I believe it's the it's www.carfoundation.org. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> so that we we can't get everything on the show, and they'll find some things there. Uh, 
in addition to uh, the governments, Denmark's example, and, and mm -hmm. we have some funds there and all, but tell us about, so as you're doing, mm -hmm. there are a number of non-governmental organizations that are helping throughout mm -hmm. Mozambique, is that correct? There are. Um, there's uh, a lot of organizations, some that you've heard of, uh, like the Red Cross or CARE, does a lot of work mm -hmm. in Mozambique. Um, and there's uh, organizations that probably none of us have heard of or European organizations and just courageous people with tiny budgets or people with medium-sized budgets and they're bringing their different expertise and somebody may be an expert in clean water and somebody else may be an expert in healthcare education and there's quite a bit of coordination among the various nonprofit organizations they get together they have meetings uh, they work closely with the Mozambicans um, it's just that Every one of those nonprofit organizations could tell you that if their budget were 10 times larger, mm -hmm. uh, then they could be doing 10 times as much uh, uh, with great efficiency. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just a matter of um, the world responding. I, I sense from your comments, and <clears throat> I'm always doing that on the program, but you, you talked about when certain people get educated as nurses and they go to other countries, more rich mm -hmm. countries, but people like you and other nonprofits, and you talked about a couple that you met there. But isn't it the, one of the hopeful signs is too when you fall in love with the people of Mozambique and their country mm. that a lot of people will stay there and even some that are there educated because of their love for that particular country? Oh, you know, I, I've met quite a few uh, American Peace Corps workers in Mozambique and when their two-year term expires, they don't leave. Mm -hmm. And they're there for the third year and the fourth year and so forth um, because they do fall in love with the people and, and the country. And um, uh, the Mozambicans are smart, they're resourceful, and uh, they, wanna, they want to build themselves, uh, to build their economy, uh, build their villages, and uh, to work with them is really uh, a great uh, pleasure. Well, that's good news for the future, too. On that note, uh, Greg, we must bring the program to conclusion, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that Greg Carr of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Harvard will be back with us next week. We will continue to discuss this uh, most exciting new work of his in Mozambique, and uh, we'll get into some issues such as the environment. And we also want to talk about uh, some of his um, ideas and purposes of his new facility that involves human rights and the arts, and we'll do that next week. Uh, please be with us again at that same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music